Well, beloved in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today's gospel begins where we left off last week with Jesus still preaching his bread of life sermon to a large crowd, many of whom had followed him into Capernaum after his miraculous feeding of the 5,000. And within this third section of Christ's bread of life discourse is found a powerful message from God to all people of every age. It consists of two very personal and profound questions. Jesus asked one of them, and Peter asked the other. And these questions must be asked repeatedly of every generation because they are related to life itself. And loved ones, there are only two ways to react to and answer these questions, with belief or unbelief. And that gets us into today's theme. Whose side are you on? Today's reading was our gospel lesson from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, verse 51 through verse 69, where the reading again follows in the name of the Lord. Please rise if you're able for the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. These are your holy words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us now in its truth. Your words are truth. Thank you. Please be seated. Today's text begins with the closing words that Jesus spoke in last week's gospel. And the reason for that we have this liturgical carryover is because this teaching from Christ is more than can be taught in one week. So it's helpful for us to remember what has occurred thus far to remind us of all that is going on in this Bread of Life sermon. You may also remember from last week's text that Jesus used the people's attraction to worldly bread after he miraculously fed the masses to begin to teach them about who he really is, the living bread that came down from heaven. And that just as a person needs earthly food to sustain human life, 
so also they need eternal food for eternal life. We learn that just as earthly food keeps your body nourished in this life, Jesus and his words, which create a saving faith in all hearts that desire to hear it, are what keep you nourished and sustained into eternal life. And the reason that you will never hunger or thirst when you have Jesus is because behind any emotional hunger or thirst, he is really what you are looking for. He is that which fills the empty void that we all have within us before the Father draws us to him. So all the desires and longings of the soul find their complete fulfillment in the Lord Jesus and his mercy. So just as food and drink become a, a part of us when we eat and drink, so also Jesus becomes a part of us when we let the Spirit draw us to him through his word and sacrament and we possess a saving faith to believe and trust in the salvation that he alone earned for us on the cross. And that is what Jesus meant when in last week's text he said, Everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And friends, that's what a true saving faith in Jesus offers to everyone who is sorry for their sins and turns from them to Jesus for his forgiveness. Living forever, never dying, eternal life, raised up out of the grave on the last day when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality. Now those who were here last week, some of that may have sound quite familiar. And the reason for this overview of last week's lesson is to make sure we realize what Jesus means in today's text when he ups the ante, so to speak, to include a very graphic description of a saving faith, one that sounds an awful lot like cannibalism. And while it is easy for us Lutherans who teach and confess that the Lord's Supper is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in, with, and under the bread and wine given to us Christians to eat and to drink, to receive forgiveness of sins, and to build up and sustain our faith, as we learned last week, Jesus' words here are not referring to the Lord's Supper. A foreshadowing, yes, but not a direct reference. Jesus' entire Bread of Life discourse is a teaching on possessing a genuine saving faith. Christ's words also emphasize something about Christian life that we need to constantly be reminded of. And that is that discipleship with the Savior involves an intimate connection, one that is far greater than any other relationship we have. You see, real Christianity is intensely personal. And it is the aim of the gospel to bring us as close to God in Christ as humanly possible. And friends, Jesus doesn't want us to be merely acquainted with him. Jesus wants us to be identified with him, literally connected to him. And, and not in some superficial kind of way, like a one day a week kind of thing where you come to gather with the gatherers and act all churchy and Christian-y, pretending to be identified with and connected to Jesus. And then the rest of the time, you go right back into your real connection with the devil and the world. No, that is not Christianity. Christianity is not fakery. True Christianity is intensely personal. It is a personal experience with the Lord Jesus Christ through his word. Christianity is a way of life. So it's black or white. It's in or out. You are either with Jesus or against Jesus. Whose side are you on? That is why the Lord has talked about being the bread of life sent from heaven, about his flesh as truly life-giving food, his blood a life-giving drink, so that all of his disciples would know his true identity and be 
personally and uniquely connected to him by faith. However, the text tells us that the Jews who disputed among themselves struggled to understand what Jesus was saying. They did not make the connection between eating and believing. So they were perplexed about the words Jesus was teaching. Listen again. John 6, 53 through 66 reads, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Amen, Amen. I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Now let me stop here for a moment. John says that Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. His main point in telling us this is to convey to us that Capernaum now repeats what Jerusalem began, namely unbelief and opposition to Jesus. So even though the majority of people Jesus was speaking to at this moment were not the ones seeking after him for their own personal gain, wanting to make him their bread king, these were the Jews who had purposely followed him across the lake after he had taught them many things and were being moved spiritually by his teaching and wanted to learn more. Yet, the text tells us when they heard Jesus speak these words, they became quite irritable in hearing them. Let's go back to the text, verse 60. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Punchline. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with Jesus. Now think about what's going on here. Jesus had added a considerable number of followers in Galilee, people who were overwhelmed by both his miracles and his preaching. These were the people that had learned that faith is a free gift which God desires to give them in Jesus. They were the ones that had learned that Jesus is the life giver, that the grace of God in Jesus is without exception meant for everyone, and that there is a mystical union between God the Father and Christ the Son and everyone who will believe and trust in him. Yet, because of this, many of his followers found it too difficult to believe all that he said. So they turned away and no longer walked with Jesus. Which means, they simply went back to the things that they had been doing in their lives before. They went from the things that Christ was offering them, living forever, never dying, eternal life, back to the mundane things that had occupied their lives before. Their common, everyday, sinful activities, the doings that lead only to eternal death. 
But it wasn't just the words that Jesus spoke to them about eating his flesh and drinking his blood that they took offense at. They were offended because it was this human being, flesh and blood Jesus, this man who was standing right before them saying he was going to do all these things. So the offense is not just the metaphysical difficulty of somebody eating flesh and drinking blood that's so tough to believe. The offense is the fact that it's this man Jesus, this son of Joseph, saying these things. You see, the true offense of Jesus to the majority of the people in the world is that they believe they can be Lord over their own lives. That they can come to all things needed for salvation by themselves without his words of life. But Christ is the only way of life. And his way is a challenging one. Listen to these words. He spoke at a different time. Matthew 7, 13-14 reads, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. In other words, Jesus sifts and sorts through people as well as saves them. And his words of life, words that cause some to repent, are words that cause others to be resentful and bitter. So, whose side are you on? So here we have this large group of followers who were walking with Jesus, hearing him give to them the very words of life, and they get mad because they don't like what they hear, and they then do what so many people do. They grumble among themselves and leave. And why does this happen? It happens because the Bible tells us in Hebrews 4.12, which reads, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You see, sadly, what ought to attract us to God, His living words of eternal life, instead offends many and drives them away. Look, you either love Jesus or you don't. You either see Him as the Lord and Savior of your life, or you see Him as an unimportant afterthought. And when Jesus speaks words like, I am the bread and water of life, come abide in me and I in you, these words will either bring you close to him and into his presence, or they will cause you to reject him and push him out of your life. Bottom line, you're either for Christ or against Christ. There is no other position available. He either rules first place in your life or he doesn't. Whose side are you on? So Jesus is faithfully preaching and teaching the truths of God and he sees his followers, his congregation, shrinking right before his very eyes. And his only crime? Telling the truth. Giving the words of eternal life to a disbelieving crowd. You know, in our world right now, and right here in America, we are going through a time of rampant unbelief. And no matter how you slice up the American population, by age, by demographic, etc., Christianity is rapidly declining. In fact, no religion is gaining. Simply put, we are living in a very pagan society. So it looks like if you're just looking at the world counting heads, Christianity is losing. Now let's compare this to the time of Jesus' ministry. If we are just counting heads, it looks like Jesus is losing. 
Because as we just read, when many of his disciples heard his words, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? And many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. But what did Jesus do when they left? Did he beg them to come back? Did he run after them trying to kiss their tails, apologizing for what he said and telling them he would improve the message and appeal to their wants and their desires? Did he promise that he would change things to be more relevant? Did he agree to tear off his tasseled robe and put on skin-tight jeans and a hip shirt with flip-flops and hire a kicking band and start over? Did he promise to no longer let God's word offend his hearers with the truth that leads to eternal life? Now thinking about this whole ordeal with Jesus and his disciples, do you think this sort of thing still happens today? That people, those who claim to be Christian, get offended by God's word and walk away from hearing it? Well, one look in the mirror of God's law and we are confronted with the damning truth that it certainly does. You see, many people who call themselves Christian in our generation don't like to hear the words of Jesus either. They don't like to hear the truth of God's word because it offends them. For that matter, many churches today no longer teach God's truth anymore because they don't want to offend anyone. So they instead choose to blindly follow and adopt the ways of the world and the evil prince who rules over it. Hey, don't worry. We're a loving church. We accept all lifestyles here, and you can continue to live any way you want. So don't worry about conversion or repentance of sin. In fact, we won't ever bring up anything like that to offend you. Never mind the fact that believing in Jesus means believing that he saves you from your sin, but like I said, we don't want to offend you, so we'll just leave that out of the discussion. So go ahead and embrace that homosexual or transgender lifestyle. Continue to live together outside of marriage. Have yourself a girl or a boyfriend while you're still married and be an idolater and party on and go do everything in the world to satisfy your flesh. Because after all, who are we to judge? Excuse me, my ear itches. Now that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but it's not too far off from some of the things I've recently been reading and seeing and hearing. You see, the message of the gospel, the proclamation of repentance and the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name is still a stumbling block for the majority of people in the world. In fact, there are many Christian churches that refuse to display a cross on the outside of the building because it might offend someone. Some Christians even get upset when they see a crucifix being displayed in a church. How sad it is that people who call themselves Christian are offended by a symbol of the core event of the Christian faith. <laughs> How sad it is that they do not even know what the core event of the Christian faith is. But praise be to God that not all who receive God's call to come to a saving faith reject it. And it's a good thing for us that the apostles did not. Listen. John 6, 67 through 69 reads, So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You know, you just got to love Peter. <laughs> Because half the time he speaks, he puts his foot in his mouth and is completely wrong. Been there, done that. But when he's right, boy, is he ever right. His words are priceless. Here, Peter's response to this question from Jesus is priceless. And with his words, Peter confesses his faith knowing that Jesus and Jesus alone has the words of eternal life. 
which means in Christ and his words, we too have the glorious promise of life beyond the grave, everlasting life with God in heaven. And loved ones, nothing else that this world offers can bring you such hope. Friends, eternal life is found only in Jesus because he is the bread of life who came down from heaven to do the will of the Father who sent him. And whoever comes to him will not hunger and whoever believes in him will never thirst. Jesus went to the cross to offer himself as the final sacrifice for the sins of the world. And on the cross he receives the full penalty and punishment for the sins of every single person who has ever lived, offering himself as the perfect sacrifice for their sin. He then rose victorious over our ancient enemy, sin, death, and the devil, confirming his success. And what glorious good news this is, friends that the one true, eternal, and all-powerful God came into our world to live, suffer, die, and rise again for us. We who are unholy and unrighteous receive the forgiveness of all of our sins and thus receive the perfect holiness and righteousness of Christ our Savior as a free gift purely because of his love for us. These words are words of eternal life. And they are the words that God the Father uses to draw us to Christ the Son. They are the words that the Holy Spirit uses to plant a saving faith within us and to teach us that Jesus is both God and man. People loved by God, God wants us to put him first in our lives above any other person or any other thing. He wants us to respect his name and not to misuse it. He wants us to hear and obey and abide in his word. And he gives us the privilege, the privilege to bear witness of our faith in both our words and our deeds. This is what it means to be Christian. So loved ones, Whose side are you on? God's or yours? Glorious Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for your words today. Allow the Holy Spirit to give this free gift of salvation, these words that you've given us today, to plant deep within us, to make us the men, women, and children you want us to be. I pray that the Holy Spirit opens the hearts and minds of those who need to have their minds open to this truth. This is a glorious message today. It can sting a little bit to some people, but it shouldn't sting a Christian. It's just the truth. Let us be firm in our commitment and our faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen.